Um, I started this this journey some time ago when uh, Gail uh, came into the office and said, uh, I can't find anybody good to teach the Bible class. <laughs> <laughs> so are, are, you, you suppose you could fill in this year? And I said, well, let's wait a little bit longer, make sure you can't find somebody else. And finally she said, there's just uh, just nobody out there that wants to do it. I don't know what it is about your people that uh, nobody wants to teach you. But I said, okay, let, let me look at it. But I want, I want to go in a different direction than I usually do. Um, I would love to get back to where the first time I taught this class probably 10 years ago now, when I talked about the life of Christ, which is my favorite subject, and maybe one of these days I can get back to that. But I decided to go down a different uh, different path this time uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that one of the things that has always intrigued me is the people that we don't know about that are making a significant difference in the world. Uh, when we, when we look today at, to, we're, we're basically going to start out with the, the reign of David. And let me tell you why that is. I, I think I said last night uh, when I introduced this, I had spent a lot of time looking at a lot of different people in the Old Testament especially, just looking for names. And, and when I find that name, I say, that, so who was this person? And why are they even mentioned in Scripture? What did they do that made them significant? And there's... There's a lot of those people where I got to the point that I, that I said I can't cover them all, but I got kind of enamored by this uh, this period of David's reign. One of the reasons is it so closely parallels what's happening in American society today. But the people that are around David and the ones that have impact on his reign and sometimes uh, straighten him out uh, are are pretty important. And what's what's interesting about them, there are several things interesting, but one of the things that's interesting is that sometimes they're neither good nor bad, but maybe both. And then I started looking at David himself, and I'm thinking, why is this guy a man after God's own heart? Because I look at all the mistakes he made. I mean, he just made some horrible decisions. He was a terrible father. He was a, he was a <laughs> ruler who was really a puppet to Joab, who was behind the throne, making most of the decisions. And, and he made a lot of mistakes. The kingdom's taken away from him by his own son. I mean, it, it just one thing after another in David's reign just proves to me there, there's a cult going on right now in, in the United States. This leads back to that. Uh, I remember back in the 70s and 80s, it seemed like we worshipped the family. Every workshop you went to was based on family and how the family was going to save society. Uh, you know what the cult is now? We do it here on campus. Leadership. Everywhere I go, I, I see, you know, how do you become a better leader? What makes you a, a great leader? Uh, David wasn't great at his family. He wasn't great as a leader, but he was a man after God's own heart. And I think that uh, Nick just pointed out why that is. Because he humbled himself. He made terrible decisions, terrible mistakes. He didn't know what he was doing half the time. Other people would tell him what he needed to do, and he would react to that. But he always came back to God. You know he made the same mistake that Saul did? Remember Saul had the kingdom taken away from him? Because he offered the sacrifice without waiting for, for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice. And Samuel says to him, at one time you were little in your own eyes, but you're not that way anymore. And God's going to rip this kingdom out of your hands and going to give it to another. David does basically the same thing at the end of his reign when he counts the fighting men so he can determine how many people are in his army. And immediately, there's a plague that comes from the people, and David repents, sackcloth, and asks. Saul gives an excuse. David repents. And I think you see throughout his reign, the thing that makes him a man after God's own heart is not his effectiveness, is not his leadership, is, is not his wisdom, it is not the way he, he deals with his people, but it's the fact that God continues to be the most important thing in his life. He has to be reminded, doesn't he? 
Remember when Nathan comes to him, talks to him about Bathsheba? He has to be reminded periodically. But at the same time, when that reminder comes, it changes his heart and his attitude just like that. Well, as I started through this, if, if you're like me, I got I got kind of kind of confused at David's life. And so the first part of this is not what I intended to do, but I'm going to kind of give you a chronology of David. So all these parts fit fit together, and then when we come back and talk about some of the people, they'll make sense to you. There is one other thing I want to say though that before we get started, that really struck me a couple of years ago when I heard a speaker make this statement. If you got everything you prayed for in the last year, would the world be better off or would just you be better off? I want you to take that to heart as we look at what God does through history and how he changes the world because if you're like me, most of my prayers are, God, I need help with this or I need this blessing or I want my grandkids you know, to have this. And, and it's, it's a pretty close group. If you've got everything you prayed for in the last year, would the world be better off? Think, think about that as we go through this. So, as we look at uh, as we look at the reign of David, let me see if I can find the right key here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, there are three passages. The first one, of course, is 1 Samuel 13 is the one to Saul. Your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And I put these in there because they, they contain this phrase, man after God's own heart. And appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. 1 Samuel 16, this is, uh, this is when Samuel goes and looks at the, he, he sees the first seven sons of Jesse. And they're all, you know, he, he said they could all be king. You know, they're, they're the right kind of people. You find out about a couple of them later that it's not as, as flattering. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at heart. And then in Acts 13, 22, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will do everything I want him to do. Well, he did. But he was still connected to God. So, the chronology of David. Uh, now, these, these dates that I'm going to give you are uh, approximations. We don't really know all these dates exactly. You know, a few of them that we can pin, pin our hopes on, but uh, most of them are, are just kind of guesses. So in 1040 BC, Paul reign, uh, excuse me, Saul reigns from roughly uh, 1040 to about 40 year reign. That's what, what the scripture tells us. About 1035, somewhere between 1040 and 1030, David is born. So he was actually born during the reign of Saul. And uh, in 1030, Jonathan, Saul's son, is a mighty warrior. And his father becomes jealous of him. Now this replays later in David's life, doesn't it? Saul tries to have his own son killed because he's becoming more popular with people than Saul is. You know, uh, the examples we have, I, I, when I used to teach Bible um, to love a Christian, one of the things I would ask people, ask students is, find me a good family in the Old Testament. I mean, if you look, uh, they, they aren't there. Uh, yeah, there may be some, but they're not, they're not highlighted. Well, even with Noah, I don't <laughs> So, you look through the Old Testament and, and you find struggle after struggle after struggle, which, which means there never was a perfect family. And there never will be. Um, I, I hear people talk about their dysfunctional families and I think, well, which family is it that's dysfunctional? 
we may think we have a better family than others, but at the same time, in our degrees, but at the same time, you look at the Old Testament, you don't find many good examples of parenting. You know, that's uh, one of the things that, that comes out over and over again. Um, in 1025 BC, David is anointed by, by Samuel. He's somewhere between age 10 and 13, most probably. And that's why he's out taking care of the sheep when the older brothers are, uh, are at home with dad, uh, you know, getting ready to do with whatever they do. But he is not not in that, that group because uh, he's out uh, taking care of the sheep. Um, 1023, and I, I guess I don't need to remind you that before Christ, time goes backwards. Okay, so you, you'll find we're getting younger every year. David is far mitzvah. He serves Saul in an ad hoc musical capacity. Um, he returns to his father's house to tend sheep, but comes to Saul whenever Saul asks for him. Oops. Okay, uh, 1020 BC, David is now possibly 15 to 17 years old. He defeats Goliath. As a result of defeating Goliath, David has promised Mirab, Saul's oldest daughter. Now there's a couple of things that are interesting to me about this. Is uh, Saul's oldest daughter is probably older than David at this point. And uh, you know, this, this whole thing falls apart, this deal. And, and it's kind of ambiguous in scripture whether Saul withdraws Mirab from the equation or because David also says, who am I that I should be married to the king's daughter? And so that union doesn't take place, but we find out, we're going to talk about Michael later. Michael is the younger daughter, and she is enamored by David. You know, she just, uh, she just thinks he's, he's a wonderful guy. It's, uh, he, he's probably the Justin Bieber of his time, you know, for some reason. I don't know why people like him, but, you know, David is, uh, is the hero. He's the good-looking uh, young guy who, who obviously has a lot of ability, and is well loved by, by, the, by the people. Um, trying to figure out what's happening in my slides here. Okay, in 1020, Jonathan, who is much older than David, becomes one in spirit with him. Now, if, if David is born during Saul's reign, Jonathan is probably all, already around, maybe as many as 20 years older. And I always read that story as if they were kind of close to each other in age. But Jonathan, uh, Jonathan's a good guy. We aren't going to read much about him. We aren't going to talk much about him. But the fact that he reaches out to David and supports him because he, he knows and everybody knows that David now has been anointed to be the next, next king. Jonathan embraces that, but, uh, uh, but Saul, of course, doesn't. In 1020, or 1015, because of his reputation, he was appointed the armor bearer to Saul. Um, this is mentioned in chapter 16, but the actual event is probably later. He later became the armor bearer to Saul, which is an important position. 1010, Saul banishes from David from his court uh, because he's hearing the talk around the town that the Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And so Saul doesn't want him around. He doesn't want the competition. So he banishes him from his court, but still puts him in charge of a significant number of troops because uh, he appreciates his fighting spirit and his abilities. Yeah, Dean, yeah. Did you mind commenting on what the significance of that could give to David? Seems like a warrior society. Well, I think that's right. This time in Israel, uh, and, and Judah, but this time in history, uh, you know, when you look back at Saul becoming king, the same word is used for Saul as king, when he's appointed king, as was used for the judges. In other words, it, it was a different dynamic than what had happened during the judges because the judges were all like local uh, town leaders or, or province leaders or whatever, and they rose to fight a specific purpose. But Saul is, is basically named the same position, but over the whole country. And from the time he's, he's named that position, 
he's at war with a lot of these other little chieftains and little groups around trying to consolidate the kingdom. So all they knew during this period of time, from Saul through David, basically even through Ishbosheth later, uh, Abner, Joab, all these guys were warriors. They were still working on the promise that God had made to Israel to subjugate the land of Canaan. And a lot of it's still not subjugated. I mean, the Philistines are still there. David actually goes to Gath for a while when he's being chased by Saul. Uh, he killed Goliath of Gath, but he becomes friends with the people in Gath. But later then, um, another person mm -hmm. comes in and defeats the Philistines of, of Gath. I mean, it's constant war is going on all over this, this country and, and battles for supremacy. Um, I, I almost like it. What, what intrigued me, and I'm glad you asked that question, because what intrigued me about this whole thing is the total, um, what, opposite opinions of people. You look at one time, you know, for example, Absalom and Solomon and David, that we're going to get to in a minute, and it says the people love David, but then Absalom started taking their uh, their love away from David, and all of a sudden they love Absalom more than they love David. And there's there's always this diametric opposition that's going on in this kingdom, and it's not solved by negotiation. It's not solved by people getting together and talking it out. They go together and fight each other. And you know there's a, there's a story we're going to kind of skip over where Abner and Joab bring their armies together, they're at this pool, and Abner says, why don't we just take 12 of our young men and have them fight each other, and that will kind of determine the battle, and the 24 guys kill each other. And so then the battle starts, and it goes on uh, for a long time, Abner's finally defeated. There's a lot of stories like that. But that's that's how you solve the difference, is by, by a fight. And the, uh, the loss of human life, the value of human life, is just, it's almost non-existent. Um, it's hard for us to understand in a civilized society, but it's kind of, it, it's, it's kind of the, the stock in trade or the coin of the realm, I don't know how you want to say it, but it's, it's what you expect. It's the way you solve the difference is to go to war. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, that's happened throughout history, less so now. But at the same time, it still happens time to time now. I mean, you look at our own civil war. Uh, I compare this in a lot of ways to our own civil war. It's who's going to have control of the country. And when it ends, uh, there really are no winners. But there, there, are, <laughs> there is a king who's appointed. And, and you look at, uh, I'm going off subject here, but you look at Solomon. Had David not consolidated all these kingdoms and all these little uh, territories and put them into one kingdom, Solomon never would have been able to rule like he did. And he kind of throws it all away. And it goes right back to what it was, you know, Jeroboam and Rehoboam start fighting each other again. And from then on through history, there's always Israel and Judah against each other. It never seems to get, to, it, it never becomes. This is what's sad. It never becomes the kingdom God wanted. The one that God... And when you look at it that way, uh, you got everything you prayed for this year. Would the world be better off? And I think what you see here is a lot of infighting. It comes from selfishness. It comes from... I, when, when, I, when I talk about Abner and Joab, one of the comments that I've got written down here for me is, why do people get so uh, desirous of power? Fame and power seems to guide a lot of this. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much economic uh, uh, gain from this. But being in charge for some reason, and that's why when, when Nick was saying this this morning, you look at Philippians chapter 2, uh, here's, here's God. He said, I don't think I ought to hang on to that. I don't think I ought to grasp the quality of God when I empty myself. And once again, I think you come back to David, I think he had the spirit of that. Boy, he made a lot of stupid decisions. You know, and I, and I, wish, we could, I wish we could find in David, you know, the epitome. And he was to the Israelites. 
here's the ruler that everybody ought to be like, but you go back and look at what David actually did. And isn't it intriguing that the Bible is the only religious document, if you look at the at all the writings of other religions, where you get the grit, where you get the reality. And what I like to do when I'm looking at these things like I do the life of Christ is put myself in their shoes and think, what what's going on in their mind? What are they trying to accomplish? Yeah. Over and over again, God said they want to be king. God said you don't want to be king. I'm your king. I'm your king. Follow him. No, we want to be king. And he calls you. But uh, that's a good point. King. But let me uh, let me kind of define that a little bit more. Because that's that's why I was saying the same word that's used for Saul was used for the judges. What the people wanted was not necessarily a king, but what's the rest of that? The king like, like the nations around us. That's what gets God up. And, and if you look at Samuel, uh, Samuel is pretty resentful of that because he's God's spokesman. And he goes and tells Saul, you know, I'm, I'm making you king because the people want it, but this is what God intended. And the same thing happens, uh, happens with David. It's not that they that God objected to them having a king. It's a king like the nations surrounding them. And that's exactly what happens. Yeah, the king uh, the king starts demanding things. Yeah. The power of the the You know, when we end this, that's where I want to come out. Because, well, let let me let me tell you an illustration. Terry has Terry left. He just walked. Out. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to talk. Terry has has guided us into this relationship with the National Correctional Nebraska Correctional Center for Women, and we have uh, twelve ladies who have gone through that program, meaning an associate of arts degree. And every once in a while, we have an event out there. So Catherine and Terry and some others and I were out there what, a couple weeks ago, and. One of the ladies just in a conversation came and came and talked to me and said, you know, what we found, um, you know, put this in context. I, I remember years ago when I was preaching, uh, there were some ladies who were doing uh, the prison ministry there. And every couple times I was asked to come to, to the jail and perform some baptisms because of those studies. And it basically changed my life. Because when I see a 10 or 11 year old coming up out of the water with all their sins forgiven, uh, there's not a whole lot of understanding there of exactly what happened. When you see a 35 to 40 year old woman who maybe has uh, killed somebody <laughs> or who has, you know, uh, done something, hurt, harmed somebody or stolen something, and you see them come up out of the water with their sins forgiven, it's, it's a different experience. It's a different experience because they understand. This lady at the prison the other day came up to me and she said, uh, you know, I want to thank you for this program, which I really, you know, I'm a bigger head. I don't really have much to do with it. But the teachers that go out there, they're transformed by this experience because they see the difference that it makes in this lady's lives. And this lady said, you know, I've been in prison now. I don't remember how many years. She said, a long time. And she said, my daughter, disown me uh, because of the things I've done and the life I've led. <clears throat> and she said, you know, she read an article about this in one of the Nebraska newspapers. And she called me. First time I'd heard from her in years. And she said, Mom, what's going on in your life? And so Mom talked to her about the York College program. She'd had a Bible class by that time. She'd had, a, I think, a theater class, communication class music class and, and she said we start a relationship and I said well how is that going she said she calls me every week and I said does she have any kids and she said that's the best part my three granddaughters and I'll talk to you every week and I didn't know their names before my daughter never let me know and she said this has helped more than just getting an education it has helped my life. And I think, uh, I think when we get to the end of this, 
once again, one of the things that I hope we get out of the life and times of David is the fact that I don't care where you are, what horrible things. You know, I've probably done more horrible things than anybody in this room. But at the same time, I, I can look back now and say, you know, that doesn't define me anymore. It doesn't have to define me. And what matters is the heart. Now, that doesn't give me an excuse. Uh, you know, as Paul said, what should we do that should continue to sin so grace may abound? God forbid. That's not, that's not the goal. The goal is to become better people. And as we become better people, our hearts need to get better as well. I need to kind of move over so I can see these at the same time. So. Okay, I, I think this is interesting. Saul banishes David from his court, makes him commander of a thousand. And then this next one. His success as a warrior has made Saul, now he didn't get the first daughter. So the second one now, who has always kind of been in love with David, at least the idea of David. Uh, and, and Saul wants to give him his wife, his daughter, Michael, as a snare. Now, women don't listen to this. <laughs> but guys, how many, how many of you think your father-in-law gave you your wife as a snare? Uh, you know, the, the way Saul uses people, of course, the snare here is that he tells David, you have to go kill a hundred Philistines by yourself and bring you back their foreskins and then I'll give you my daughter. And David originally says, well, you know, I'm, I don't want your daughter because who am I to be married to the king's daughter? And when Saul puts this condition on he says, oh, well, if, you know, if I can buy her by just killing a hundred people, I'll go do that. Once again, the, the value of human life is just, it's a commodity. And if, as far away as we are from this, it seems okay, but what if one of those guys that was killed was your son? I mean, they, I, I mean, I think we need to look at this from all sides. But this is a this is a horrific time, and no one is safe. You think what's going on in the middle in the Middle East now is painful? You didn't have somebody just come by saying, hey, "I need to kill a hundred of you so I can get a wife." You know. So anyway. Um, he gives his daughter Michael as a snare. Now we're going to look at Michael in more depth, so I'm not going to go into that here, but I really think it's interesting. But here, uh, in 1007, at Jonathan's warning, and Michael's, David flees from Saul, uh, and Michael remains behind with Saul. <laughs> she actually intercedes for, for David at this point. At this point, she's a good one. In 1006, David and Jonathan covenant together. We've got that story about shooting the arrows and, and uh, and we won't be looking at that. In 1005, David is living off the land as he encounters Nabal and Ab uh, Nabel and Abigail. We're going to be looking at Abigail as one of these unsung heroes. Uh, his people provide protection for Nabal's flocks. Uh, Abigail, if you remember, comes and brings food and, and prays and keeps him from, from coming down and destroying the whole, uh, whole land. Nabal, you know, when Nabal hears about this, it says he sits down on a log and feels over backward dead. Because uh, he, he had a heart attack, evidently, or a stroke, because he realized how close he was. So Abigail saves his life so he can die. <laughs> um, and while David is gone, Saul gives Michael to Paltiel, or Palti in some uh, translations, and Galen, which is probably on the border near here. So Michael is now uh, married to someone else. David takes Abigail as a wife, and he also has another uh, wife called Hinnom, who is with him at this time. Uh, 1000 BC, Samuel dies. Uh, I'm not going to look, look at all that. Uh, he prophesies that Saul will die and his sons will die. David's women are all taken away. Uh, they, they come and approach Ziklag, and uh, Philistines come and take, excuse me, Amalekites come and take Ziklag. And, take the wives of David's men captive, and David go and recapture the women. About the same year, uh, David, with the help of his allies, becomes king of Judah. He's appointed king uh, with Hebron as his capital, and he reigns there by himself for seven years. A lot, of, a lot of times I think we skip over this and think, well, Saul died and David became king. David is only king of, of Judah at 
this point, and he's there for seven years and six months. He marries uh, another woman. He also marries Haggad. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a list of these people in a minute. Here are David's wives and sons. Michael, who bears no children. Now, if, if, you, if you want to criticize Solomon, please understand where this all got started. It got started with a man after God's own heart, who has a lot of wives, a lot of kids, uh, and during all this time he's building a palace, he's fighting wars, he probably is not close to any, as we find out later, he's probably not close to a lot of these kids. Uh, some of them he loves more than others, he's got favorites, and this uh, has a whole dynamic in, in the kingdom. And his kids grow up without much, uh, uh, without, without, much evidence of morals or ethics. They, they're constantly at war with each other. But uh, you look at all the, the kids that he has, uh, Kaleeb, Abigail's uh, son, probably dies young. Because Amnon, if you remember, he, uh, he's the one that lays with Tamar, Tamar, and Absalom eventually has him killed. He waits a couple years and has him killed for that. So that makes Absalom the oldest son who is in line to become king. And you read the whole thing about Absalom and David, and Absalom is just trying to hurry things up because he's going to be the next king, right? And it's not until later when Bathsheba intercedes and says, you need to name Solomon as king before you die, and David is kind of, he's already kind of losing it. He's probably in his 90s. Uh, he's having a hard time functioning. And Bathsheba, you know, has him named uh, Sol Solomon's king. So anyway, here are all the kings, and here's a bunch more. We don't know who their mothers were. Uh, and then he had other sons by concubines. So you, you look at this uh, palace, and there are kids running around everywhere. And, you know, some of them David probably knows pretty well. Others he may not have a close relationship with, especially if it's a child of concubine, because they aren't even named. You know, so wherever these kids are, and so you can imagine the the class divisions even within the palace of who's important and who's not important, and it's a, it's it's kind of just a mess. So in 998, Ishbosheth with Abner as his general. Now Abner was Saul's commander in chief, and hopefully later, before we run out of time, uh, not today, but this week we want to look at I want to look at Abner and Joab. These guys are the fixers. Now I, I told you there's a lot of parallels today, especially Joab who's the who's the guy that just got indicted for all the stuff he did for Trump? Anybody remember his name? Yeah. Yeah. Cohen. Joab is the is the Michael Cohen of David's. And he does some underhanded nasty things to where David finally says, hey, I'm not going to do anything to him, but make sure that his head doesn't go down in peace because he killed in peacetime as if it were in war. I have to tell you, that scripture became monumental to me in my deciding in the 70s whether I was going to go to war if I was chosen. I, luckily, I got missed in the draft. But a lot of us then were conscientious objectors and it was for religious reasons, but I looked at that passage and said there is a difference between killing in peacetime and killing in war. And I think that's a significant, that's a significant passage to me. It really helped to clarify my, uh, my decision at that time. Um, Abner slays Asahel, who is Joab's brother. This eventually leads to uh, Abner being killed. After Ishbosheth accused Abner of infidelity, this this is intriguing. I don't know if we'll spend a whole lot of time with it. Abner, uh, Ishbosheth says, Abner, you had sex with my father's concubine. And Abner says, Am, am I a dog that that you would you would accuse me of such an offense? And at that point, he decides that he's going to go over to David. Now that to me had a lot of parallels. I, I've been thinking a lot about this because you know how easy it is in today's world to ruin someone's reputation? I mean, it was it was easy back then, but a little harder because you didn't have social media. And when I read that, I thought, this sounds a lot like the Brett Kavanaugh here. 
it's a he said, she said kind of thing. And no, I don't think anybody knows the truth in any of this. But Abner says, if you think I'm that kind of person, I'm leaving. And he says, I'm going to go turn the kingdom over to David. And David at that point says, well, Abner, I'll meet with you. Uh, and we can have this meeting about the kingdom. But you need to bring my wife back. Michael, who has now been given by Saul to another man, is living with him. The story you read about that is, is uh, Abner goes and, and gets him and takes him to David, and her husband follows along weeping and crying and whining the whole way because obviously it's breaking up his family, and Abner says, get out of here before I kill you. So he turns around and goes home. <clears throat> Michael comes to the palace. And there's some interesting stories there that I won't get into now, but she is there, uh, you know, evidently through most of David's reign. But uh, evidently, they never had any relations. David just wants her there because this is my wife, she was taken away, and I want her back. Um, and so... She's not exactly just there. Well, no, she's not. She was at one time. But uh, we'll, we'll see that when uh, David brings the ark into the, back into Jerusalem. We'll get, we'll get through this, and then I think that's probably all we'll talk about today. In 997, David conquers Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, you find... Uh, anybody know where Jerusalem... It's called Jebu Salem. But it shows up earlier in history. Anybody know where, where that is? Melchizedek is the, is, is the priest of God, and he comes uh, from Jebu Salem. This is eventually where uh, David establishes the kingdom, or the, the uh, capital of the kingdom. Uh, in 993, Isbosheth is murdered. Abner has kind of set him on the throne. He's, he's worked to make him the king, and fought against David and Joab and their armies. Uh, but then David is publicly anointed king over all of Israel at that point. So what is that? Uh, I didn't go back and look at the dates, but... Um, Probably from about what 1,006 to 996, so you know at least 10 years of war has taken place trying to decide who's going to be in charge of this kingdom. And real honestly, a lot of it's decided by Abner and Joab, uh, not by David and Isbosheth. Uh, David's a little more involved. Isbosheth is not involved at all. He's kind of a puppet set up on the throne. And Abner is the force behind the throne. David, however, you know, is still leading his people. But a lot of times they won't let him go into battle because they don't want him to get, they want him to get hurt. So, 992, the ark is returned to Jerusalem. Uh, the tabernacle remains in Gibeon. And this is where David says, I want to build a house for God. And, you know, that, that story, you know, we won't look at that. God intercedes and says, no, uh, you've been a man of war. Uh, we're, I'm going to let, the, let someone else build this house. In 982, after seven to ten more years of war, he solidified his empire. Uh, David's sons, I, I think this is interesting, you look at 6 Samuel 8, he has made his sons advisors. Does that sound like anything going on? <laughs> but obviously, uh, as it says here, it distorts their sense of self-importance. And Absalom is going to be a case in point about that. Mephibosheth, and we're going to look at him a little more deeply, is found. David honors the pledge that he made to Jonathan that uh, if I find any one of your relatives, I will make sure that he, uh, uh, he has a full life. And so he finds Mephibosheth, he gives him a, a lot of Saul's original <clears throat> land that he owns. Uh, later there's a conflict between Mephibosheth and Ziba, who is uh, kind of the caretaker for all this. And, it gets, uh, it gets a little messy, and real honest, I don't really understand how it ends up the way it does, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, 980, uh, while indulging his children, allowing his generals to run their own war, David falls prey to the temptations, and he sleeps with Bathsheba. Uriah is slain uh, in April. In December, Nathan confronts David, and he repents, and the child dies. You know that story. Uh, I think that's probably one of the more famous stories, and we won't be looking at it. This, of course, is the scripture where Nathan comes to him, but I wanted to, I wanted to point out this prophecy that, uh, that Nathan makes to David. 
that this is what the Lord says, out of your own household I'm going to bring calamity before your, your very eyes. I'll take your wives and give them to one who's close to you. He will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I'll do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. So David has already given word of what's, what's going to happen. Um, 978, Amon Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar, who's Absalom's sister. 976, Absalom murders Amnon. Uh, I think uh, Absalom's an interesting guy because he takes revenge, but he waits a couple years to do it. I mean, in every case, he kind of waits till the Fuhrer has died down, where everybody kind of forgets about it, and then he steps in and never moves. He was banished from the king's presence to Geser. Uh, in approximately 975, then Solomon is born. So all this stuff that's taken place in the palace is prior to Solomon's birth. So he probably knows about it or has heard stories about it, but it's not, not something he's been involved in. Uh, 974, Absalom returns to Jerusalem via Joab's intercession. And then he uh, coerces Joab into interceding again. So you can see the king, but then he starts his revolt in 9. Uh, 69. He steals the heart of the people. David does has no clue that's going on. Uh, Absalom sits outside the city gates and people come in. He says, uh, you know, what, what's wrong with your life? Well, if I was king, I would make it right. And he steals the heart of the people away from David, who had really lost touch with the people, except with the general and his people. Uh, we'll talk a little bit against Hushai and Ahithophel. Uh, because that's an interesting story. I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, 968, a three-year famine occurs as a result of Saul's attack on the Gibeonites. The attack violated the covenant made with uh, them by Joshua. You can go back and read that, Joshua 9. 966, David makes amends with the Gibeonites by having seven sons of Saul executed, except Mephibosheth, who he promised he would take care of. So, you know, once again, uh, I, I, I mentioned last night that I wish I could talk about Jehoshaphat, who is a Old Testament. Uh, she is the, the mother of a child who she hides from Athaliah, who has killed all the king's uh, kids. She hides him for, I think, seven years until he, he can be made king. Uh, but this is a common occurrence. Get rid of all the heirs. And once again, the, the uh, no sanctity of human life, no concern for, for people. I mean, we, we're in all these fights over abortion right now, and back then, uh, abortion could take place when you're 40. <laughs> I mean, you know, just get rid of people. Uh, 962, David's health begins to fail. Uh, let's see, Bathsheba convinces David to declare Solomon king in waiting uh, for the promise in 2 Samuel 11, and have him assume the throne, David agrees. In 961, David dies a natural death at 70 or 75, although David begins to rule at age uh, 30 to 40 years. He may be older than 70 if uh, we add some Solomon's overlapping rule. David's buried in Jerusalem, uh, and let's see, having served God's purposes in his own generation, Acts 13. Once again, it's a man after God's own heart. And I didn't get to talk about anybody except in passing, but we'll start tomorrow by looking at Jonathan, excuse me, Abner and Joab. And I, what, do we have a break right here? On some, anybody have a schedule? Yes. The answer is yes. What is it? Okay. You got a break for 10 10. And then the infamous Dr. Terry Sacrowin will take over and talk about restoration.